There's nothing going on in the state government. And I don't have anything to do with the Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Uh, well, thank you. Good. Oh. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh huh. Two cent words. Yeah. Well, you. Yeah. Tonight we're. So it's going. It's going to stick heavy with me. Okay. Yeah. I don't forget. Yeah. I might misplace it, but I don't forget. Is this the menu application? Okay, we're recording that. Great. I'll be right back. Already this month was two hundred and twenty. So it's not even enough to take care of it. This is a little more than the other thing. I have a stack of this. You can look at other things from our board. Well, I see. We know this process is a little bit sweeter. And we're going to tear that apart. Okay. Yeah, so that way there's nothing left to guess uh, with this particular question. It's a big one. Yeah. Um, both, I know I've heard the word by APA, they get word like that, you know, come to mind. Um, just 
Yeah. Always eager to learn more of this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a big one because this is one that um, psychology, especially when it comes to false guilt, has really throws a lot of weight behind. So we got to know as biblical counselors how to respond to that. So we're going to, we're probably going to spend the majority of our time on this question tonight. Um, so I know there's at least one more person. Uh, and before you get started, did you say you are going to keep that in the statements to this question? The which statement? Relate your understanding of this to the concept of false guilt? Yes. Because I have an email from Pat Bird asking me possibly the same questions. I didn't get that either. Well, let me just be <laughs> a little more history. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the theology exam question, that he made a moving requirement to relate your answer to the concept of false guilt. Oh, they did. Oh, I think they tell us fellows that when they do that. <laughs> pardon me, pardon me. This was dated October 7th, 2022. Oh, wow. Okay. But it was very important because I updated all of our templates. I know it sounds funny, all of our templates, but it's like one big template. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the way ours are. Now, you can verify this, but I'd be happy for you to have a copy of this. I'll double check when this, if I if I close everything down, it'll it'll mess everything up. But I will verify when I get home tonight. Uh, I still want to talk about it because I, um, I think it's very important. But um, if you don't need to, to write on it, that's outstanding because that frees up a lot of room. In this question to write what you need to write so that's great if that's the case thank yeah. you for bringing that up yeah. no 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 it's just something i keep very close to yes because yeah <laughs> yep yep <laughs> all right well let's pray and then we'll we'll hop right into question 13. <laughs> all right oh, heavenly father thank you for tonight thank you for granting us another chance to meet together to talk about your word and the truths of your word. And, and tonight, as we talk about substitutionary atonement and salvation and justification, as I've prayed multiple times, uh, I come before you and ask again that we would apply all of what we're talking about to ourselves first so that we um, can find joy in who we are and in what you've done, specifically in what your son has done. Um, and God, guard us from bring, being prideful, bring, being puffed up. And um, I just ask that you would sharpen us as instruments in your hands so that we can be used by you uh, at a moment's notice. And so we thank you again for tonight. I know a few more people will come in uh, later on. Uh, for those that can't be here tonight and those that might be listening later on, I pray that you would be with them. And um, may tonight bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, in case you you, you weren't here, the um, it, it sounds like, and I'll confirm, I'll, I'll send this out, but it sounds like they might have removed this last little part, they, ACBC and the powers that be there, might have removed this last part about uh, false guilt. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious as to why they would do that, but um, I'll, I'll find out. Uh, that's got my mind working in uh, a little bit of overtime there. So what I've done tonight is highlight... The, the the parts that I think you're going to want to touch on in your answer, definitely the parts that we're going to want to talk about as a class, because we're we're wading into kind of uh, the the deeper end of things. But I would also say we're wading into things that are very they, uh, not that the other stuff doesn't have massive implications for biblical counsel, but this one in particular, the issue of guilt and what do we do with guilt psychology is all over that and you will see um i have quotes from secular psychology and, and so you'll you'll see that there so uh let's go through this question they'll provide an explanation of first part and the biblical basis for the doctrine of substitutionary atonement uh, sometimes another word is put at the beginning there penal substitutionary atonement so we'll, we'll talk about that whole thing but explaining the implications of this doctrine for human guilt over sin. 
All right. Um, and then relate your understanding of this to the concept of false guilt. So that's what we're going to attempt to do. Now, what I wanted to give you, and I know you can't see this all that well. Um, remember, though, I'll send the PowerPoint out. You can go through it if you want. Um, but there are other views of atonement besides the penal substitutionary atonement. And so I think I just thought it would be good for us to, to talk about, like, why do we have to hone in on this one kind of concept of, of substitutionary atonement? So um, first, uh, the governmental theory of atonement, that would be the way to see that. So it, and what that states is that Christ suffered for humanity so that God could forgive humans without punishing them while still maintaining divine ju um, divine justice. So in other words, um, right, like this is Christ suffered um, so that we could be forgiven and God doesn't look like he's just sweeping our sin under the rug, right? But at the in, in that structure or in that thought of atonement, I'm still guilty. I'm just forgiven. It, it doesn't do anything with my guilt. Does that make sense? I understand what you're saying, but no, it doesn't. Oh, okay, okay, good. The, I'm, I'm not saying these make sense. Oh, yeah, these yeah. are just yeah. ideas that throughout church history have, have been there. Um, right, so then another one is the ransom theory, where Jesus paid a ransom owed to the devil since he had legitimate rights over sinful souls in the afterlife. Now, I'm still guilty, but Satan has no rights to me. And, and I, I don't know about you, as, as I went through all these, I thought, I, I think there's bits and pieces that I can, like, I either heard or I agree with or I wrap my mind around. Um, but notice I'm, I'm highlighting the fact I'm still guilty. I'm still guilty. I'm still guilty. I'm still guilty. All right. So then the satisfaction theory um, uh, it is is closely tied to the ransom theory, but Jesus infinitely honored God with his life, death, and resurrection, thus satisfying the offense of Adam, which nullifies God's need to punish humanity. Right? So God, Jesus satisfied God's wrath, but really what what the what this theory talks about is that the big sin, the, 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 not the, the big sin, um, the 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 biggest effect of Adam's sin was that God's honor or his glory was diminished. And so what Jesus did was he returned that glory to God, right? So I'm still guilty though, but God's honor is restored. So notice there's one theme throughout all of these. They're not touching on I I'm guilty, right? So then there's this recapitulation theory. Christ succeeded where Adam failed thus undoing the wrong that Adam did. Now, now we're starting to get into a little bit more of the, we're sliding towards the heretical side of atonement theories, just FYI. Um, so this here, this, like, this really, if you take this, you don't have to, you don't have to go very far, but if, if you take this to, the, to its nth degree, um, this applies to all of humanity, not just individual people, right? So the recapitulation theory Christ undid what Adam did. Therefore, you fill in the blank. Like everybody is. It's almost like what, like Catholic Church teaches. I mean, Christ died. Yeah, it, it, it's almost a universalism. It's done. It's done. Kind of, everybody yeah. thinks I understand he died for sin. Yeah. I don't have any. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think that's very believed. Well, once we get down to shared atonement theory, that's blatant there. I, I would, I, I think, but these two really, they're, yeah. Um, and then you've got this moral transformation theory, sometimes called Socinianism, but Jesus' death offers a perfect example of self-sacrificial dedication to God. Now, that's all he, that's all it does, is it gives, Jesus gave us an example. Didn't do anything other than give us an example. Um, so, I'm definitely still guilty here. Um, but he, he gave us an example of what self-sacrificial living looks like. Um, right here, he undid what Adam did. And then the shared atonement theory, Jesus, life, death, and resurrection, is applied to all of humanity. All are saved. 
right? So you can kind of draw a line right there and say these are not universalism when it comes to atonement. These definitely speak towards universalism. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to put any of this in your answer. <laughs> Please don't, because um, it'll just take up space that you desperately need. But I, I think it's good when you're teaching. What, what are some other atonement ideas that are out there? Um, because if we're talking about the substitutionary atonement, right, it's vastly different than all of these. And I think the implications when it comes to biblical counseling are massive, especially when we're, you're, you're talking these things. All right. So ACBC wants to know that you you're not in these in any of these camps. Um, all right. So then as we go here, the penal substitutionary atonement, um, really, this came to light in the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, there's a lot of people who added stuff in. Um, just if, if you, the, those two names are kind of at the beginning. That Jesus bore the wrath of God on the cross, and he did so in our place. I'm, I'm watching people nod. That's a good thing, right? So he did so in our place, meaning he actually did something, right? Now, if I go back here, um, Christ suffered for humanity so that God could forgive humans. There's potential there. God could do it. Now, if we go here, he did. Not could, but did, yeah. One thing that really stands out to me there is that, well, two things. They're totally not saying anything about God's grace. Yeah. And to say that God's honor could be diminished in any way is yeah you know and i mean christ paid for it so it was paid for yeah yes so there's there's not kind of the the potential idea but that jesus actually did something um so this is a huge statement right and especially when we talk about and we're, we're going to kind of go through some examples from some counseling examples that you might run across very you know frequently um, where this, this means all the difference in the world, um, right? So four important aspects of this atonement. And here's some words that, that we were talking about, 25-cent words, right, instead of two-cent words. So, um, so four important aspects of this atonement. Number one, sacrifice, right? So Jesus, and, and now think about how we're starting to connect a whole lot of things that we've already discussed and maybe you've written on, um, right? Like God being fully man right? He actually was a sacrifice, not just theoretically, not hypothetically, not spiritually, but physically, he was a sacrifice. He made the payment that I owed for my sin, right? Now, propitiation, that's one of those 25 cent words, right? Um, right? He satisfied God's wrath for my sin. Satisfied it, took it away, gone. Um, and if you want to think of a cup filled with God's wrath, he, he drank it, you know, all the way gone. Mm -hmm. Substitutionary, meaning Jesus took my place. He took your place. He took the place of those who belong to him. And then reconciliation, meaning I have been made right with God. Right. And so here's some, some implications there. I'm his child. I'm his friend. I have peace with God. And here's what I highlighted, though. I'm a new creation with zero guilt. Zero guilt. We all tracking on the same page here? Yeah. It's me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, but this, so a quick story. Um, so when I was a youth pastor and kind of, kind of got the idea that the church I was at was no longer the place that I was going to be. I started sending my resumes out, and I use I use churchstaffing.com. Um, it's kind of like there's a wide range of churches on churchstaffing.com. But I thought that certain denominations were fairly safe. That in, in my naive thinking, um, I just thought that. And so one of those that I went towards was the SBC, Southern Baptist. All right, and I thought surely they're all right. So with two different SBC churches. 
I had got past phase one, I got past phase two. Don't know why they waited till the latter phases to ask me this, but two churches did this, two SBC churches. Um, they asked me what I believed about the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. And I said, yes. I, I, I And they said, okay, then we're, our interview is done. Um, we, you won't be a good fit here. Well, you don't believe that. No, we don't. Okay, all right. That, I'm glad we got that out of the way here because that would have been... Now, we never got into what they do believe, um, but that was that was where the interview came to an end. So, so here's this. Um, right now, let's talk about this implication. Um, and these are just, these readily popped into my head. So we can add to this if, if you want to. But implications, since I am not guilty, I am not separated from God. Right, I'm as close to God as I could be. Now, we, we do have to talk about here in just a minute what happens when we sin. Um, and, and we have to wade into a lot of what we're going to talk about. I just feel we need to talk about it for um, discussion's sake so that nothing is kind of left hanging. It doesn't mean that you have to add all of this discussion into your answer. But I want to make sure that, that we kind of get a, a good picture here. So I'm not separated from God, but what, so what happens when I do sin? That, that we, we need to throw that out there, and we'll try to pick that back up in a minute. I have a relationship, a real relationship with God. Uh, we could even throw an intimate relationship with God in there. Right? He draws near to me. Yes, I draw near to him, but he draws near to me. He loves me. Um, here's another one that just popped in my mind. He knows me. Right. Um, I might not want him to know all the parts of me that I, I'm aware of, but he knows me. And I'm, I'm thinking um, of, of Matthew chapter seven, you know, when not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, and, and all that. And at the very end, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. So that's the people like we, we don't want to be in that category. But that means, though, that if if our guilt has been taken care of and Christ was our substitute, then he knows us on the level that we need to be known. So he is for me, not against me. Right. Romans chapter eight. Very end there. I can boldly go to him as my father. I can ask for things. I can share things with him just like my kids do with me. Um, and as I was writing this out, my my little three year old Baylor came in. He's like, Dad, I drew you a picture, <laughs> and um, I said, Oh, cool. He was here. You can have it. So I had it. It was just it was. He took a red crayon and he scribbled on it, um, and and or on, on a piece of paper and he handed it to me. He goes, You want another one? And I said, Yeah, I, I, I love one. He goes, What do you want me to draw? And I said, You surprise me. He came back in, red crayon, scribble, <laughs> handed it to me. He said, Baylor. This looks just like this. He goes, oh, you're right. Can I draw you another one? I said, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm doing this, right, as as he's as he's doing that for me. So he came back in, and it looked very similar, just had a yellow crayon. Um, and, and I said, I said, buddy, these all are outstanding. I got to get back to my work. And he goes, okay, I'll just put all my new drawings in a pile over here. And he did. Every once in a while, he'd just come back in and set another one up. And they were just scribbles, and they were scribbles. And I'm going to keep that pile forever because I love him, right? Um, and 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 so he, but he can boldly come to me, <laughs> um, and and he and 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 ask things and, and share things with me. Um, I look forward to eternity with God because of the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. Right? Heaven in in the the and even death itself is not scary. Um, what's on the other side of death? Is not scary. And then I welcome God's discipline, knowing it's for my good. It's no longer punishment. It's actually, it serves a different purpose. It, right? It, it's training me. Um, and it produces, at least according to Ro or Hebrews chapter 12, it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness if I'm trained by it. Mm -hmm. right, that's what Hebrews said. Other implications you can think of to the this idea I think of Psalm 91 mm. you know just that comfort yeah um, it's not just I you know it says and you, you add an intimate relationship with God but yeah 
One thing that comes to my mind is um, going back to Romans 8. Um, who, can, who, can, who can lay any charge against his elect? And in some of these constant cases, we've got um, a, a spouse who has been beaten down by the other spouse verbally over and over again. Like everything is that person's pattern. Yeah. I'm guilty for everything I don't do it, blah, blah, blah. And uh, in some way, you know, it is possible that that person could be guilty of something. Sure. Yeah. But uh, this lets me know that according to the God of the universe, you can't be beat down. Yes, he has forgiven. Mm -hmm. and I am, I am, I am free. I'm, I'm free. I'm, I'm free from all of that. Yeah, even though you're trying to lay it on me, I know it's, I know you're wrong. For one thing, I didn't do this. Yeah. So even if you think I'm guilty, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because my father says I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, well, yeah. No, I, I think um, I'm one of, the female counselors they had out in, in Washington, she just finished writing a book on spiritual oppression and abuse. And 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 she she it worked has worked with a lot of women in abusive situations where they forget all of this. I mean, they're they're believers, yeah. but because over and over and over, and I, I'm not even going to all the horrific details that I have in my head, but they have just come to believe exactly what their husband is accusing them and, and, and saying that, that they are and it takes a while for them to really grasp this and it's not that they don't have it but it's actually seeing with new lenses mm -hmm. uh, this is who i who i am absolutely yeah. uh, a, a woman here that doesn't narrow it down very far since we had a you know, thousand people here yeah um but she grew up in a home where uh, she had a very distorted picture of love from mm. her father. Yeah. And it has been the hardest thing in the world for her to understand what normal, real love is, and even God's love. Yeah. For her. It, it took her a long, long, long time to, to understand this. He loves me. Yeah. Yeah. Because if, if she's defining... God's love, according to what she's experienced That's over exactly. here, yeah. that I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. Like I, that, that would be my conclusion, or I'm scared of that. Or scared. yeah, That's exactly it. Yeah, I'll never be able to please this God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So these, I mean, these are huge implications. Since I'm not guilty, right now, you know, if, if I'm thinking right now of Second Corinthians chapter ten, verses three through five. But where, well, let's just go there for a second, because this is a huge counseling tool. So um, this is where the end of it, hey, Bill, um, talks about us taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Um, but there's a whole part before that. Um, so for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Uh, what does the KJV say? Does it say strongholds there? Anybody? Yeah, it's pulling it, down the stronghold. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, if, if you read a whole genre of Christian literature, they will say strongholds has something to do with demons and, and, and things like that. That's not what Paul's talking about here because he defines for us what strongholds are in the very next verse. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. There's the definition of strongholds. In the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, a stronghold is something that's an argument and a lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And so when I'm doing a, uh, when I'm doing a diagram I will often draw this kind of a stronghold. You'll quickly find I am not an artist, right? Um, but this is our stronghold. And I'll, I'll ask the question, What if, if you're up here, what does this stronghold do, right? It 
protects and it what? It's keeping people out, but it's also keeping people in, right? So it's imprisoning. And, and that's what these arguments and these lofty opinions do is they keep people stuck in here, right? And so what uh, like a, a homework assignment that I'll do is I want people to write down what are the common thoughts, arguments, lofty opinions, prideful opinions that keep you stuck in here, right? Things like God will never love me. Mm -hmm. Things like I deserve X, Y, and Z, right? And so as they're telling me these things, I'm making stones out of them like this, right? And so we'll just fill this up. And then if, if we've done our job well, they'll see how strong the stronghold is. Day after day, those thoughts just keep them trapped right where they are. And so I'll say, so now what we're going to do, next part of our homework, is we're going to create scriptural bombs that we're going to lob at this. And that these bombs have to correlate directly to this lofty opinion or argument, right? Um, so just for example's sake, God will never love you. Well, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. <laughs> like, so we're going to lob that bomb at this. And the goal with all of this is so that there's just a pile of rubble, and I am not imprisoned by this anymore. Now, the key, though, we don't just want to stand on this rubble. Mm -hmm. We actually want to move forward out of the rubble. Because if not, our flesh, we're like, It'll start to rebuild, <laughs> right? And it'll it'll want us to get stuck again. So for some people, and I think of this this woman that, that you were talking about, if you've grown up hearing these things over and over and over, they actually rebuild really quick, mm -hmm. right? And so um, it's it's faithfully walking beside somebody to find out. Anyways, that was that wasn't part of my notes at all. Um, but but. Right, implication of not being guilty is I don't have to be trapped in here. But we often like this is this is a spiritual concept that physically makes its way out in us. Because if you're stuck in here and you're hearing those, those arguments over and over and over again, and you're living with guilt, does that work its way out physically? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fresh and you name it. Yeah. 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 High awesome. blood pressure. I mean, we, we could go through all kinds of medical issues. A lot of, I, I, especially when it comes to people who have been in abusive situations, I find a lot of autoimmune diseases are, mm -hmm. are in there. Now, I can't make a direct correlation to that. But what I can say is as women have come out of this, and, and I say women because that's been my experience. I'm sure men can be there too. Um, but as I've watched women come out of this, those autoimmune things sometimes go away completely but they're diminished significantly in how much they're impacting. So, so here's this. I, 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 this is all part of this discussion. I want you to see how important this question is. Now, I do want to talk about false guilt. Um, and even if you don't have to put it into your answer, just to round out this, this thought, right? So guilt is defined as a real judicial condition caused by sin so now we're not talking about a feeling we're talking about a state of being you either are guilty or you are not guilty right um so one is not guilty because they feel guilty they're guilty when they violate god's standards or if we if we come down just a little bit you're, you're guilty when you violate a standard um Example of speeding is a great, it, it's great to illustrate this concept, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if this happens to you all. I will confess here a little bit. Every time I drive by a police officer that is parked on the side of the road, I hit my brakes and my heart starts to pound a little bit, right? Um, there's a, there's a, a, a tinge of feeling guilty there, even if I'm not speeding. That's just a, a natural response. Now, I've also been guilty of cruising by a police officer who I didn't see, and I was speeding not intentionally, but I, there was um, one example in Port Orchard, Washington, where I was the, the, the youth pastor. There was 
-hmm. He came out of Port Orchard. There was, it, it was owned by the city of Port Orchard. They felt it was a good use of tax dollars to put speed limit signs up. That was great. The city, I'm sorry, the, the county of Kitsap um, owned a, about a hundred foot strip in between what Port Orchard owned here and here. They did not feel the need to spend money, but lowered the speed limit by 10 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So I would come out of Port Orchard, go on 35, hit this short strip of road where it was down to 25, and then we'd go back to 35. Well, guess where the Kitsap oh, County uh, Sheriff's, not the Port Orchard Police, but the Kitsap County Sheriff's, guess where they sat? They sat right there. So I was coming down and I, I went through there and I looked through my rear view mirror and I'm, there was lights and I pulled over and the sheriff asked me, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, no, I have no idea. It's because you were speeding. I was speeding. And I was going 35. He goes, yep, the speed limit is 25 back there. I said, uh, I didn't know that. And that's where he told me. That's what they did. Um, okay. I don't see how that's right or fair, but I was guilty even though I didn't know it, right? So feeling guilty is not an indicator of actually being guilty and not feeling guilty is not necessarily indicative that I'm not guilty. Does that, does that make sense and all that? Okay. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, those who are guilty are subject to punishment. So, you know, I was speeding, I ended up with a $160 fine. Um, and which there for for two hundred dollars, you can pay this two hundred dollar fee, and it won't go on your record if you don't get another ticket within a year. So I was encouraged to do that, and then I did a community service to pay the two hundred dollars off. So it didn't cost me anything um, except for I think for eight or nine Saturdays all day, I picked up garbage with uh, work release people and. Got to share the gospel, and anyway, anyways, it, it worked out well. Um, <laughs> except for just a quick, the the one guy who was in charge of the whole thing, he picked me up first before he went to work release, and so he said, "So what are you doing this for?" And I said, "I I uh, I, I got a speeding ticket." And he goes, "No, come on, really? Why, why are you doing that?" No, I got a speeding ticket. I just went through how I'm cheap, and I didn't want to pay a speeding ticket. Blah 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 blah. So then all the prison release work people got in. First thing he said, hey, ask this guy why he's here. Oh, like, there was a lady right behind me who had killed her boyfriend and like all this other stuff. And I was speeding. How are you doing? Uh, so, anyway, that was a fun, fun little thing. Um, right. <laughs> oh, these thoughts just, these stories come in my head. Oh, yeah, that's why that happened. So, um, so you know, penal substitutionary atonement is the only view that can adjudicate guilt, get rid of guilt. All the other ones do something. Um, but they, they don't get rid of guilt. So then we've got false guilt. It is a secular concept based on feeling guilty and not a judicial standard. Now, I do want to talk about what, so what happens when I feel guilty, but I'm not guilty of breaking God's standard? Isn't there something there? And there is something there. And maybe that's why ACBC, they said, this is going to take too long in order to arrive at a solid conclusion. Yes. The note to me was that they said there was really no such thing. So we're, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So false guilt, it's a secular concept. It's based on feeling guilty and not necessarily, I probably should put necessarily in there, a, a judicial standard. So the goal with this is to help someone oh, not feel guilty. That's the goal with false guilt. It's not to actually do anything with the guilt. It's to help them not feel guilty for what they've done. So a legal condition is not changed, nor does it even come into the discussion. Right. So if I'm a secular counselor or secular psychologist, I don't even care about the legal condition. I care about how you feel and changing that feeling of, or actually removing that feeling. That's my goal. Now, what I've done is I found some different quotes to help you. This is small. So just bear with me as I read it. Uh, once again, you'll, you'll get the, the PowerPoint. So here are some quotes. Guilt and its associated causes, advantages, and disadvantages are common themes in psychology and psychiatry. And by the way, this is a secular quote. This is not coming out of a biblical counseling you know, thing. So both 
in specialized and in ordinary language, guilt is an affective state in which one experiences conflict and having done something that one believes one should not have done. So then notice who's the who's the judge and jury here? Yeah, the, the person feeling the guilt, right? So that one believes one should not have done, or conversely, having not done something one believes one should have done. Right? It gives rise to a feeling which does not go away easily, driven by conscience. Now, Sigmund Freud described this as the result of a struggle between the ego and the superego. So with, with Freud, there were three big components that made up everybody, the id, the ego, and the superego. Uh, and the id and the ego were, um, they were kind of at opposite ends of the, um, one was the super conservative kind of beat you up, the other one was kind of like the hero, and then you get the ego in the middle, right? Now, this says parental imprinting. Freud was a huge believer that your parents imprinted what they believed on you. And so you just absorbed that and that caused a lot of the guilt issues. Now we won't go into what happened with in between him and his parents, but I, I, I think that had a lot to do there. So Freud rejected the role of God as punisher in times of illness or rewarder in times of wellness. Now that had to do with the time period in which he lived. While removing one source of guilt from patients, he described another. This was the unconscious force within the individual that contributed to illness. Freud, in fact, coming to consider the obstacle of an unconscious sense of guilt as the most powerful of obstacles to recovery. So I put this in here because that's true of most counseling. They will say this issue of guilt, that is really what's behind and undergirding a lot of what's going on. So we need to help somebody not feel guilty. We don't want to remove guilt, right? We just think that the, the feeling of that is what's wrong. Now, Alice Miller, different quote here, claims that many people suffer all their lives from this oppressive feeling of guilt, the sense of not having lived up to their parents' expectations. There's that parental imprinting again. No argument can overcome these guilt feeling, feelings, for they have their beginning beginnings in life's earliest period, and from that, they derive their intensity. This may be linked to what Les Parrott, uh, he is a psychologist out in Seattle. Les and Leslie Parrott, they're, uh, if you might have heard of them. They're, they they uh, head up the psychology department at Seattle Pacific University. Uh, anyway, um, and he calls it the disease of false guilt. And it's at the root of false guilt is the idea that what you feel must be true. If you feel guilty, you must be guilty. Now notice he he puts it kind of in reverse order, um, right? If you feel guilty, then you must be guilty. And, and Les and Leslie Crow, by the way, they, they would be integrated psychologists. Um, now, according to psycho, the, the psychoanalytic theory, that's Freud, Sigmund Freud. Whenever you hear psychoanalytic, that's Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung. Now, according to that theory, defenses against feeling guilty can become an overriding aspect of one's personality, meaning everything you do is to try and get rid of guilt. That's what Freud believed. The methods that can be used to avoid guilt are multiple. They include repression, usually used by the superego and the ego against instinctive impulses, but on occasion employed against the superego and the conscience itself. Everybody's somebody's going to be like, blah, 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 blah. I'm just what, what I'm what I'm trying to get you to see here is just how how integral this part, this idea of guilt is to psychology and what they're trying to do, right? Um so if I'm I'm up here, if the defense fails, then in a return of the uh, of the repressed, one may begin to feel guilty years later for actions lightly committed at that time, right? So if you want to rephrase this, if I come to you and you're a psychologist and I feel guilty, I'm probably going to go back years to figure out why you started feeling guilty. And we might go back five years. We might go back 10 years. We might go back 15 years. 
There are some, it's slightly on the ridiculous side of things, but they would go back even to the actual day of your birth. And uh, I'm, I'm telling I've seen videos where people relive the birth process, believing that in that process, you started feeling guilty about things. When I say, re I mean, they're acting it out in an office, the birth process. Okay. That's on the slightly crazy side. Like, not everybody does that. It's out there, though. Um, all right. Also, uh, an, another defense mechanism, there's projection, um, and that's a defensive tool with wide applications. It may take the form of blaming the victim. So the victim of someone else's accident or bad luck may be offered criticism. The theory being that the victim may be at fault for having attached to the other's hostility. So uh, alternatively, not the guilt, but the condemning agency itself may be projected onto other people in the hope that they will look upon one's deeds more favorably than one's own conscience. So just another defense mechanism. Number three, sharing a feeling of guilt and thereby being less alone with it is a motive force in both art and joke telling. While it is possible to borrow a sense of guilt from someone who is seen as in the wrong and thereby assuage one's own, and it should be sense of guilt. And then last but not least, Self-harm may be used as an alternative to compensating the object of one's transgression, perhaps in the form of not allowing oneself to enjoy opportunities open to one or benefits due as a result of uncompensated guilt feelings. So in, in, in other words, the person who can never enjoy anything because they feel like they should be punished for what they've done. All right. So these are defense mechanisms as a result of it. Yeah. Now, this is according to psychology. I, I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> while we are not from a um, point of view, because we understand the God standard, and we all stand guilty before God for our sin nature, and then for any sins. Yeah. Um, is it is it wrong to notice the behavior of some and say, I think they feel guilty because I see them behaving in such a way to kind of, you know, tip the balance in their favor for someone or in front of someone you know uh -huh. what i'm saying is i wouldn't treat somebody i wouldn't um counsel somebody by let's repress this or um, let's use projection yeah or not to share you know or or <laughs> so we can tell somebody to harm themselves yeah yeah but um but is it is it not possible to new people do those things and mm -hmm. tag that as true guilt. So what we can do is observe people and come to the same conclusion psychologists come to you're guilty. Right? You're now psychologists say you feel guilty. Right. I would say, and I could probably even agree you feel guilty, but where we would differ Psychologists would say you feel guilty, but you're not guilty. I would say you feel guilty because you are guilty. Now I need to follow that up, and that's what I want to make sure that, that we do here, right? You're you're guilty of breaking some standard. That's that is what I would want to bring up. And I think even psychologists would probably say, okay, I can agree with that. You're you're breaking some standard, but what I want to do is boil down to what's your standard. A psychologist would say, I don't care what your standard is. I want to help remove the feeling of guilt. That's that's where we're going to hover and stay is this feeling of guilt. I want to get to what's your standard so we can match it up according to this and let this change your standard if it needs to change or leave it in place if it needs to stay in place. And then you respond according to that. And that, that'll make sense in just a minute. I, I 
I, but, I think I understood what you said. So what I wanted to know, it's not wrong for us to observe and, and really in our minds, they, they are repressing something. Um, they are. I mean, I, I, I have watched people tell jokes mm -hmm. and you know that it's like, yeah. You know, like make me feel better about uh -huh. the way I am. Yeah. You know? Um. So where where I want to be careful here, yeah. the idea of repression, um, that's a Freudian concept. So think of an iceberg. I mean, this is a, yes. a very, yeah. Yes. And so it's going to be way, way down there. Um, and, and I just, uh, I, 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 I want to be careful with that term of, of saying, I can recognize when somebody is repressing something as opposed to saying, ignoring something or, um, not aware of something, whereas the Freudian term of repression um, is it, it wanders into way, if that makes sense. Yeah, without getting into perception. So that uh, I, I'm I'm actually okay with that um, because you could say project or blame, um, and they are really interchangeable when we're talking psychological concepts like this. So. Yeah. Sorry. No. Great. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So the book tells, uh, uh, gives an example of an individual who feels guilty because she doesn't vacuum every day. Yeah. Said, you must vacuum every day. Yeah. So she has this feeling of guilt. And it's because she has no standard. Well, it was her mother's standard. It's not God's standard. Yeah. Now, if she's in her house, it's God's standard because you honor your, your parents. Yeah. Uh, if you moved out on their own, it's not it's not her standard. Anymore. Yeah. Or it could be. So she feels guilty if she doesn't do that. Yes. So how you how would you respond to that? So that's where that's starting to get into what is your standard, and let's bring that standard over to here. I I, I do think um, what, one thing that I'm I'm very conscious of with eight kids is making sure they understand this is dad's rule in dad's house versus this is God's standard. So I might say, I don't want any dishes in the sink when I wake up in the morning, <laughs> uh, right? Um, and, it, it, and if I do find dishes in the sink, I'm not gonna be very happy. But Jesus didn't have to die for dishes being in the sink. Now he did have to die for you not obeying what I'm asking you to do. Two very different things. And the reason why I, I, want them, I want them to know that very clearly is so when they leave, the issue of guilt doesn't go with them. Now, I would love all my kids, when I walk into their house in the future, there's no dishes in there. You can see that's a little oddity of mine. Um, that, which, by the way, is very funny because my dad had the same rule. And I remember one day, my, my brother and my sister and I we, we got to talking and we thought it would be funny. I still haven't asked my dad how he responded to this. There weren't any dishes in the sink because we put them all on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask him one night, Dad, how did you respond to that? I still remember that though. Okay, they'll be in the sink. They'll be on the floor. Um, so, um, but it, that that is what, what I would want to do is not say you shouldn't feel guilty about that. What I want to do is dig into what's your standard that you're living by that's producing the feelings of guilt. And let's let's let this be that standard. So that way your, your conscience starts responding to, to the word of God, not to mom and dad and not, I'm kind of jumping the gun here a little bit, not even to Ben Marshall, your counselor, right? I don't want you to, to look at me, view me, start to use me as the standard maker in your life. And that can be, we have to be aware of that as counselors, that if we're not intentional with that, people can start to go, oh, I need to adopt Ben's standards. No, 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 no. You don't need to adopt Ben's standards because they're not perfect, <laughs> right? You need to adopt God's standards. So we'll, we'll get there in just a minute. And, and I do have three examples that I want us to think through. Um, but uh, so here's here's some some uh, just a few more. I promise I, I won't I won't belabor this. But guilt is an emotional state produced by thoughts that we have not lived up to 
uh, or yeah, not, not lived up to our ideal self and could have done otherwise. Guilt operates on two levels. First, guilt is cognitive. That's just another word for thinking. That is, if we are consciously aware of our perceived failures or wrongdoings, or that is, we are consciously aware of our perceived failures or wrongdoings. And then secondly, guilt is emotional. Guilt can make a person feel sad, angry, anxious, or discombobulated. Guilt can cause physical reactions as well, ranging from upset, upset stomachs to anxiety attacks. Now, there's some things in there that we can agree with, but this person here is making guilt something that scripture never makes it, right? Guilt can make a person, I don't think guilt can make somebody. Now, can somebody feel bad because they are guilty or can somebody feel sad because they are guilty? Yeah. Absolutely, but guilt doesn't make me feel that way. I feel that way because I am, right? And then and there, this guy down here, Martin Hoffman, he talks about how guilt is developed in somebody. He says, infancy, um, there is no guilt present in babies. Now, would we agree with that? We would? Well, <laughs> from a from a made in the image of Adam, like our imputed guilt that we have at conception, we would disagree with that. Now, have babies done anything yet to, to like action wise? Who they are um, is, is different. So. Infants do not have a sense of a separate identity, and they're unaware of how their actions affect others. Guilt, therefore, is impossible. Um, I, I would disagree with that, but we don't have time to get into that. So uh, early childhood, as toddlers, children know they have a separate identity, but still are almost completely unable to understand someone else's sense of identity. So toddlers know when they physically hurt someone, but typically not when they emotionally cause harm. So, you know, I, I would disagree with that. Um, but middle childhood, the sense of being a separate person is complete. The child is now frequently aware of how his actions affect others, both physically and emotionally. He or she can now experience feelings of guilt for causing pain. And then finally, adolescent to adulthood, the teenager or young adult has now developed a more acute and nuanced sense of self. He or she is aware not only of how his personal actions affect immediate people in his life, but also how his actions may cause harm in a broader way to the community, to his company, to society. If you think of the woke movement, mm -hmm. um, right? That it's, I mean, psychology is undergirding that whole thing where you are guilty as a race because... Right. And, and, and yeah. OK, so guilt now operates on both the personal and general levels. And then last but not least, unfortunately, not all guilt is healthy guilt. There is also unhealthy guilt, often called neuroses. This type of guilt can be debilitating. The guilty feelings do not go away by any of the healthy means of resolution where you apologize, you make amends or you're punished and often results in the suppression of feelings as well as creating intimacy problems. So that's the last of my psychological quotes. Um, but I wanted you to see how big this issue of guilt is when it comes to psychology. It is a big, big, big deal. Um, so, uh, and, and issues of forgiveness are in there, because I don't know if you know this, but um, psychology is a huge proponent of forgiving, uh, of forgiving somebody. Um, they, they would actually say, it's really, really healthy for you to forgive. They wouldn't say biblical and they wouldn't say good for the other person, but it is healthy for you to forgive, meaning it helps you, makes you feel better. Um, and, and it helps you avoid a lot. I mean, they, they, would, they would say and acknowledge lack of forgiveness brings about all kinds of physical ailments. And so in order to stay away from that, you should forgive. Um, but their sense of forgiveness is not the biblical sense of forgiveness. And so uh, we'll we'll save that discussion for when we get to that question. So here, um, and we'll we'll take a break right after this. Um, examples to flesh this out, right? So now think about all that we've been talking about. And if someone is caught looking at porn and they feel guilty. How would a non-biblical counselor approach that person? based on what we've talked about. You just have to guess, but. 
Yeah. yeah. Maybe they would justify looking at. And what might that sound like? I, I agree. I think they they would um, try to make them not look guilty by redefining the standard. Like. And what might that sound like? Like. What's wrong with looking like that? Okay. What's wrong with that? Everybody. Everybody does it. Right, you're you're not hurting anybody else. Um, right. So, but what they're trying to do is erode that standard that's there, or ask lots of questions. So you feel guilty about that. Why do you feel bad about that? Oh. You know, my 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 dad always, or my my parents always told me it was wrong, or church always told me it was wrong, or you know something like that. Oh, okay, so why why does that bother you? Then there's what what they're trying to do is erode that standard, but really what they're ultimately trying to do is change the feelings. Now I think Christians can accidentally do the same kinds of things. When somebody has a standard and they feel guilty, and we say things like, oh, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. I don't know if anybody's ever said that. Or when you go to confess your sin to somebody, they respond to you. Yeah, that's that's nothing. That's no big deal. <laughs> if you ever have been the recipient of that, like, oh, now what do I do? You don't think it's that big a deal. <laughs> I'm riddled by this, right? Um, so we like here, we want to be careful and not minimize what somebody's going through. We don't want to minimize sin in any way, shape, or form. We want to maximize God's standard and then say, now this is where we go back to substitutionary atonement. What happened to your guilt on the cross? Paid for. Paid for. You are no longer guilty. In in the sense that you're going to be punished, in the sense that you're going to be removed from God, right? Now, this was a fun one here, as I thought through this. A woman who believes she should wear a head covering while in church and has her covering blown off by the wind and into a puddle while on her way to church and then feels guilty because she chose not to wear her covering while in church. <laughs> but I'll I help her change her standards. <laughs> Go home and watch it online. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In the in the, the post-COVID era, right? Yeah. You, you can go home and watch it online. But but how would you well first off, how would you guess integrated or secular psychology would now I don't foresee somebody going to therapy or counseling over this one issue. But let's just let's just say. Um how how would you guess they would deal with that? Undermine the erode the standard. Okay. Right? Yeah. Or um so let's uh, yeah uh, and, and what I what might that sound like to erode the standard? Like and we're we're guessing here just a little bit, but what's a statement that could be made that would erode that standard? That's that was an old cultural thing. Okay, and it's not for us today. Okay, that was an old cultural thing, not for us today. <clears throat> and the important thing is you're at church. Okay, the the important thing. And notice, I wouldn't disagree with any of these statements. I would I would agree with them. Um, the the important thing is that you're at church. That was an old cultural. Okay. Mm-hmm. Notice, even in our, our 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 Christian mindset, we we can do that. Um, even oh, God's a forgiving God; mm-hmm. he, he won't hold that in against you. Which substitutionary atonement? That there's a, there's some truth to that. We're just talking about that. But notice, the goal, if we're not careful, can be to help them not feel guilty as opposed to go back to God's word and change this, help them not, not change their standard, but help them see what the standard is in God's word. Right? Um, if, if if you want to change this, maybe. You guys tell me if this would, would, would change at all. Um, not the, the woman who believes she should wear a head covering 
but somebody who believes alcohol is always wrong and they go to a church service and they only serve communion and wine is there. Or the alcoholic who believes one sip and I am I'm toast and they go to church, there's communion and they only serve wine. That can get a little... <laughs> I, I, here's a real example. Um, my dad was stationed in Italy. Uh, he was a chaplain in the Navy. He was stationed in Italy. He was about 40 um, minutes outside of Naples. He, he and my mom lived in a little Italian community. So think, everybody knows everybody. They've all lived there for hundreds of years, right? And they were very, very proud of their wine, okay? Um, and so Corey and I, and at that time we only had five kids, but we all came um, and so just the fact that we had five kids, everybody came out of their houses. Oh, you know how many kids? Chinqua, ah, okay. Um, and, and so now the church I was at, um, when it came to alcohol, complete abstinence. Pastors were not allowed to drink alcohol at all. And guess what they wanted me to drink? Word. And why? Because they, they were very, very proud of it. Guess who had to live there after I went back home? my mom and dad who were trying to witness to them. I'm, I'm just showing you how this can play itself out in a very real way. Was that guy in it? No, it was um, oh no, it wasn't guy in it. <laughs> my uncle, my, my, uh, my wife's brother one he was in Gaeta and that was that was the staple. Yeah. I mean, okay. It, it was on the table. Right? Yeah. On the table, but kids drink it. Everybody drinks. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was just the standard. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and and when I got back, Jim Sewell, who is the executive pastor, I was talking through it with him, and th it, it was before he became ACBC certified and had to wrestle with this. And he came from a Wesleyan background, and the, he was a fire. To, he was the fire chief for San Diego, and then became the fire chief for Seattle before he was the executive pastor. And he was very black and white. And nope, this is what the Bible says. I would not do this. And well, what about my parents who were there? And doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> like he had his way of navigating all of that. Okay. Um, now this one here, I, I, I went from something easy to something very complex. A, a woman who is sexually assaulted and she feels guilty. Because and the reason why I bring this out here is I think the compassionate thing is to say you shouldn't feel guilty. As opposed to what's going on that's making you feel guilty. Does that make sense? I, I don't want to spend a lot of time digging into this because it's uber complex. Um, and at the end of the day, you might leave here thinking something I don't want you to think. <laughs> like we would need to devote an entire two hours to this in order to understand um, things I, I'm just bringing this up because this is a very common biblical counseling scenario, um, meaning some a, a woman feels guilty even though she's been sexually assaulted. And what we want to make sure that we do is don't minimize what she's feeling and minimize the experience and help her wade through this. Because the last thing I, I'm is kind of bringing back something I just mentioned. Uh, um, few moments ago. What we don't want is for people to look to us to define the standard. We want them to get in the habit of going here, right? The living, active word of God. Now, this is that's touching back on the sufficiency of scripture, which we talked about at the beginning. So let's take a break because we're about 20 minutes after the time we normally take a break. If you have questions, I would love to entertain those questions. But when we get back together, we will wrap up the last two questions. I promise we'll get through those tonight. Question from Senator Gill. Yeah. There are two words, uh, two uh, phrases that are going around in the world culture. Um, uh, microaggressions yeah. and gaslighting. Yeah. And is that tied to guilt? Um, so I think gaslighting is intended to produce guilt in somebody. Um, microaggression are probably um, probably meant to do the same thing. Um, but yeah, it's all it, it, so it's a tactic, right? That's being used 
to try and make people feel guilty at a corporate, when I say corporate, um, uh, for woke purposes at a racial level. So you should feel bad because you're a white, a, a white Christian man. Um, you know, I'm not bad. You should feel guilty, right? Um, and so the response to that then is, depending on how far in the spectrum you want to go, it can be anything from just saying I'm sorry to, you know, giving up your car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, having come from the, the, my doctor is from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, they went down that road. It didn't go completely down the road and do what was being demanded of them, but they, they went farther down the road than I think they should have. Well, Bob Jones made a statement. They made it a okay. because they had a racial policy that mm. the um, mayoral members of the faculty yeah. in, in, uh, coming here in 2000. Um, it, was, it was the policy, and then they, and they reversed that policy. Yeah. Because they, they used, a, they used a, a, a scriptural reference that was not. Without contact, yeah, so a whole, a whole that. And, and so I think there, there's real guilt. Yeah. Um, and so where there's real guilt, somebody can really repent and really be forgiven. Um, so the, but when, when I say real guilt, I'm not talking about a feeling. Yeah. I'm talking about they're, they're really they, they violate really God's really standard. Really yeah, really yeah, and. and the, at that point, what you have to do, you have to make a statement. Uh -huh. Playing for me, yeah. I'm saying she's yeah. to ask for the reasons. And Ashley, yeah, a couple yeah. Years ago. And, uh, and, and was, the people who have turned who upheld that policy have long gone. But yeah, you, yeah. You know, so as an institution, so that's an institution uh -huh. held with policy. Yeah. Now, what happens if someone accuses you of gas acting? Um, I I would ask, what do you mean by that? So, okay. yeah. I've done the psychology, psychology thing. Yeah. When someone's accusing you, you know that they took something wrong, or maybe they're already in odds with you. That lets me know that, well, I have a form of narcissist in it. Sin in it. Yeah. Okay. But at the same time, what it does is, Allows me because I know myself better than anybody. I use the word tactic in the book when when they they just want to just keep trying to light fires under you and just trying to tear you down. So you will feel that sense of false guilt. It's just it's really stupid, but I use that the key word gaslight because they walk around and they're not happy unless they're with the people that they hang with. But if you're not in that clip, they carry a gallon, gallon of guilt with them. I call it just try to pour it all over you. Yeah. And then light it and walk on. And then what you what you just spin with your mind, mm -hmm. I call it they'll separate you, separate you from other people, or excuse me, they will separate themselves from you. And what happens is they put you in a room. You know, it's like you can walk into a room and everybody else will leave. And I'm one of those people that will say, hey, God, it's just me and you. That's, it just eradicates the guilt. Right. Because, hey, because I'm, I've learned to have to deal with it. I've <clears throat> been on the other side of the fence, and now that I'm on, on the right side, you know, don't think you're strange. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen. But I, I, I do think that when it comes to that issue, somebody accuses you of something, um, the, the humble thing is to say, you know what, I'm going to think about that. Maybe, maybe I did. And, and I'm going to I'm, I'm going to really take that to heart. Now, that's the first time. If they keep doing it and you've already examined yourself and you've either asked for forgiveness or you've come to the conclusion, I, I'm not I didn't do what you asked me, what, what you accused me of doing. Second time they do it. We've already talked about this. Third time. We've already talked about this. Fourth, uh, right. Like I, I wouldn't play into that. But the, the first time. um I, I'll I'll think about what you said, and I'll examine myself. Um, maybe even bring a couple other people into the. And it, do not want that when you say that word right there. Oh yeah, yeah. You literally, one step right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and there, there's the the beauty of Matthew 18, right? So two or three, 
who can confirm that because if if they can't or if they if they don't see it right then it's a it's a done deal um and uh, i've i've faced that a couple times as a counselor where people brought an accusation against me and some might say you know oh you just diffused it that way uh, i just followed matthew 18 i said i i welcome other people into this process because if i'm wrong i want to i want to repent i want to ask for forgiveness i don't want to you know be this jerk who who's hanging on to his sin um and and to your point usually it's nah, 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 nah. let's not do that um we or there's no need to do that or you know they, they that's, back that's, off that's, kind that's, of that way yeah 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 <laughs> yep. so but it is frustrating um especially when your reputation is what's being you know attacked um, I just had to, so with, with ACBC, um, if somebody is not happy with the counseling process, you can actually make a formal complaint. Um, and then as an ACBC counselor, um, I have to like, uh, so a formal complaint was made against me, uh, for some counseling that ended about a year and a half ago. Um, but I, they just filled out the complaint. And so it came to me here and I just wrote a five page response to it. Um, but I, I, in that response, I'm like, I'm wide open, but here's all the stuff that we did. And this guy's under church discipline. I mean, uh, so a whole bunch of stuff that, um, yeah. So well, it still bothers me. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure I would have remembered everything that had happened that far back. So what kind yeah. of notes do you keep on how in depth? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. So I use a program called Biblicare. Um, and it is, it's a biblical counseling online platform that after every session, I type my notes in. Actually, I don't, I just copy them because I use OneNote, if you're familiar with OneNote. Um, that's what I use in the middle of counseling. And then I just cut and paste those into this. So that way I can recall all of my stuff. But then also the church I came from, we had a very detailed church discipline process, meaning I had to have specific dates, specific details, specific scripture when I brought someone to the elders um, for consideration of church discipline. So that was, that's, that's part of that process. Um, there I've had two complaints lodged against me. Both guys were disciplined. They were under discipline. Um, and they were not happy, uh, with, with me that I, uh, and both were abusive men. Um, so, uh, I, I can't say there's a correlation there, but I can't say it's not connected. Can you, so. can you help reducing your feeling of guilt? <laughs> I don't feel guilty. Actually, I'm at the other end. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't revel in this. Like, ooh, you are ticked, and it makes me feel no. Anyway, it makes me feel good, not bad. So, anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, All right. So, question fourteen, and really, um, these these are simpler to answer. Because there, there's not a whole lot of, of uh, complexities built in, but they're so important. important. Absolutely. So question 14, explain what it means to trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Um, right? So we've got some, some things that I just kind of brought out here. Trust, Jesus Christ alone, and salvation um, are some things that we want to make sure that we address. So Number one, mankind was designed for an intimate relationship with God. I think we can we we can agree. In Genesis one and two, um, I should be in the garden, not in the garden. Um, but innocence, no guilt existed in the garden prior to the fall. Um, right now, notice I I didn't put in there perfection, um, but it's it's innocence and no guilt. And the reason why I, I make a distinction there, perfection would mean that Adam and Eve had all the knowledge that they needed. They, they didn't need to learn anything. Like they, they were perfect. And, and they, but the intimate relationship they had with God meant that they were continuing to learn from him. They were growing in their relationship with him, right? But there was innocence there. So life, physical and spiritual, existed in the Garden of Eden, and there was intimacy physical and spiritual, and that existed in the garden. And then after the fall in Exodus 19, that's where God gave the command to build the tabernacle, right? And that was where God rested with his people for a brief moment. Uh, I, and I'm saying this a little hypothetically. I don't know the time frame. I just know how quickly I can sin, 
Um, but so for a brief moment, after the sacrifice was made by the great high priest, there was there was perfect intimacy with God and man, right? That sacrifice covered the sin. Now, I don't know how quickly that was undone. Um, I've, I've read about how many sacrifices probably were made and how bloody the temple would have been and all that. So I don't think it was very long before it happened. Um, but sacrifices needed to be made before intimacy was restored. And then, you know, my, my question is, through this, what happened if a guilty man, guilty high priest, entered the presence of the Holy One without, or I should say, with, with any sin? What happened? Fell over dead. Fell over dead. Um, I don't know if you know the the, the process. Yeah, well, yeah, you got strange fire with those guys, right? Yeah. Um, so, but but in generally speaking, with a great high priest, they tied an ankle around his or an ankle around his rope, a rope around his ankle. The other way around would be very difficult, um, right? Because if if there was sin and he entered into the presence of God, he dropped dead, and they needed a way to pull him out uh, without going in there himself, right? So in Genesis 1 and 2, you have the, the garden. In Exodus 19, you have the, the tabernacle. And then one day, almost the entire book of Revelation, right? That's going to be restored where we have perfect intimacy with God. Uh, and that, that'll be when Christ comes back to bring his people home with him. So mankind was designed for an intimate relationship with God. And let's go back real quick. Explain what it means to trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's what we're we're talking about here. So this is what mankind was designed for, right? But man's sin separates him from God. So there is this, this is how God designed us, and then this is the problem. And we're, we're building our rationale here for why do we trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Because we were created for this, and then we messed it up, right? So I, I think there's these components are, are there. Salvation then is the or sorry is the reconciliation of man to a right relationship with God with eternal implications surrounding the fact that he is with God forever right so there's this when we're talking about trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation that there's this reconciliation aspect now that's going to feed into forgiveness these things all start to build on each other um, so you'll you'll see that in in subsequent in subsequent questions. But man is born seeking or trying to make things right on his own apart from the finished work of Christ, right? People try and do penance all the time. Um, and I, whenever I think of penance, I, I think of Martin Luther in the Reformation period when I, literally you could pay an indulgence if you wanted to do that. But I think, if, if my memory serves me correctly, where the light bulb came on for Luther, not necessarily when he's like the Romans 116 mm -hmm. light bulb, but the other light bulb that got him to start thinking about things is when he watched people like crawling on their, their hands and knees up these steps, um, some form of, of penance and then paying indulgences, all these other kinds of things, trying to find their salvation, trying to be made right with God. Also, law-keeping. Making sure I, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. Suppressing the truth. And I'm pulling that out of chapter Romans chapter one, where people suppress the truth. So instead of trying to do penance or law keeping, now I'm just gonna try and shove the truth down of who I am. I don't need salvation because there's no God. I don't need salvation because I'm not that bad. I don't need salvation, right? Or hiding. And we see that with Adam and Eve in the garden. First thing they did after they sinned, they went and they hid. So Man is born seeking salvation or trying to make things right on his own apart from the finished word of God. So here's what we were created for. Here's the problem that we run into. And Jesus then is the only man who satisfies all the law and the commands of God. I said that in the present. You might want to say in the past, satisfied, still satisfies. Um, but right, the law was designed to show us the nature of God, his holiness, and that we could not keep the law despite our best efforts. Perfection was the standard. No amount of law keeping nullifies past law breaking. Even on a, uh, like if I go back to the speeding thing, if a policeman pulled me over and he said, you were speeding, but yesterday I, 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 I was going to speed on it all day. Like, doesn't that count for something? <laughs> no, that doesn't make up for you speeding here, right? Um, 
right? So no amount of law keeping nullifies past law breaking. We need someone who is able to keep the entire law his entire life. And so Jesus was the one who did that. And in doing that, he revealed the glory of God's righteousness to us, mm -hmm. right? Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to nullify the law, but to fulfill it. So here's the, the, the three components, right? When, when we go back to that question, um, whoops, there, there we go. Explain what it means to trust in Jesus Christ alone. It means acknowledging this is what I was designed for, acknowledging this is what I did to mess it up, and then acknowledging, and this is Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection. I have to trust. You can also use the word hope, right? And not like, I hope tomorrow it doesn't rain, but it is a, I'm, I'm convinced mm -hmm. this is what is true. It is my only hope. Um, there is no other answer. So those are the three components that I think, um, and I kind of wrapped it up here, but those are the three components I think you need to have built into that question. So here's four bullet points. Your answer needs to speak about man's need to be saved from sin and subsequent guilt of sin. Now, the reason why I put this in here, this lets your greater know you're thinking about the previous question, substitutionary atonement. You're, you're linking that together. Your answer needs to speak about man's intrinsic drive to try and fix his problem of sin and guilt apart from Christ. Um, and then your answer needs to speak about Christ being the only fulfillment of righteousness. And then last but not least, your answer needs to speak about Christ's righteousness offered to us by faith. And I put this in here because that's going to speak to the next two questions. Um, but it's letting your greater know that you're tracking, like we're in the world of salvation right now from a theological perspective. And you absolutely recognize that um, in your, your writing with that in mind. So any questions about question 14? There another question about the eternality of salvation, or should we say something about that here? Like we can't lose salvation. Um hmm. I if I, I I don't I don't know if there is. That's why I'm 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 wrestling with that right now. Actually, in question 13, you could in a simple statement say, because of the substitutionary atonement of Christ. I can't do, I didn't do anything to get it, and I can't do anything to lose it. It's eternal. It's, it's uh, forever. Um, so, could put it there. Yeah. I'm trying to think, though, I mean, it wouldn't be wrong to put it here. Uh, I, I, I think just making sure you have uh, a good transition, or like it, it fits the context. Um, so salvation because salvation is not just the moment that say but I'm meaning completely saved and one day I will be completely saved. Yes. So the the three parts justification, sanctification, glorification. I think you're going to have other opportunities to speak to those other two things, um, which is th they want to know what you believe about justification here. So I would I would save any info related to sanctification and glorification for other questions. Um, but it's really tempting to talk about all of it right here. I just I know you'll write way beyond a page and a half uh, if you do that. So. Um, as a matter of fact, question 15 starts to I mean now they're breaking things out even more, right? Provide an explanation and a biblical defense of justification. So they, they want to know what do you believe about justification? So and before we dive into this, any other questions about question 14? Does there need to be anything about, about works? Or um, faith alone that saves, but faith that saves is not alone. Is there anything that needs to have um, 
a response to what it looks like to trust Christ alone. Trusting Christ. Um, I I think what you what you could say there, and what, what I'm saying this is it's kind of a personal preference what you want to put here. Um, but touching on it, I think you you could say trusting in Christ alone for salvation will come with fruits or will come with evidence of that, but it doesn't produce that. If that makes so I, I think that kind of touches on what you're talking about. Um, as opposed to the, and I, I don't want this is another 25 cent term, but we, we don't want to paint the picture that we're antinomian, where uh, I'm saved and I can do whatever I want, right? Um, and, and Paul addresses that, may it never be. So we, we, we don't want to paint that picture of um, I can I can just make a profession of faith and then I can go on and live like I want. I've counseled too many people who were, you know, at, at a summer camp or what, whatever, they walked down the aisle, they they wrote their sin on a piece of paper and burned it or whatever. Um, and and their life never changed after that. And they're they're left wondering, why am I still doing this stuff? And and as we sat and we we dig into things, lo and behold, they're not they haven't trusted in Christ alone for salvation. Um even though they were taught that language, they never did it. So do we need to address that? Yes. I only if you want to. <laughs> I I think just a clear written explanation of what it means to trust in Christ alone for salvation. You're probably going to fill a page to a page and a half with that. Um, but if you have extra space and you want to, and you uh, just to say it, this will be pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I do think if, if, if I mean, you you could, you, you would very easily paint the picture to or or um, relay the understanding to your reader. There There is 99.9% .9 of the time there is fruit in the, the life of somebody who does that. Now that 0.1%, um, I'm leaving room for deathbed conversion, like, you know, the, the thief on the, the, the cross. Internally, there was probably lots of things that happened. Externally, couldn't see a whole lot. Um, but we can we can compare the other the other guy on the other side of Jesus. Um, but I'm just I, I hope that makes sense when when I say that. I'm not trying to. Mm -hmm. I think there there is always fruit. We just don't always get time to see it. And but for for the majority of people, when they place their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and trusting him alone for salvation, you see fruit. So, yeah. All right, so let's talk about this one. Provide an explanation and a biblical defense of justification. Now, this is my last slide, so we can spend as much time on this as we want, um, right? But when we're talking justification, what is justification? So we want to give an explanation of what this is. So I would encourage you, I'm, I'm going to have this up here, but if you want to reference a systematic theology book, feel free to do that, um, uh, a, a solid one, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, not just any one, but a solid one. But this is a legal term meaning to declare not guilty, but instead righteous. If you are justified, you are free from guilt, released from punishment, and imputed or given, right, and imputed with righteousness. And it's not just any righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ. So you you are seen as perfect. And this is where, if you wanted to bring in positional sanctification, uh, not to, I don't want to get too deep at eight o'clock on a Wednesday night, um, but there's this idea of positional sanctification. I am holy because of who I am in Christ, um, as opposed to progressive sanctification. Don't talk about that yet. Um, well, there are plenty of questions where we get into that. Um, but um, if you wanted to talk about it, you, you don't have to. So, um, But here, you are free from the power and the condemnation of sin. Now, I love that statement because it's leaving something out that we are not free from, which is the presence of sin. Right? We're free from the power of sin, meaning we're not enslaved to it, and we are not condemned 
by our sin anymore, but we are plagued, at least I am, <laughs> um, you know, by, by sin. I, I am still wrapped in this flesh that is enmity with God. If I, and, and um, there's a book called The Enemy Within by Chris Lungard. Anybody read that book? He, he talks about sin is like a rhinoceros. Um, and, and, and that rhinoceros running through drywall, you can put up drywall after drywall, a piece of drywall after piece of drywall. Rhinoceros is coming through, um, right? And, and our, our sin nature, our flesh can be just like that rhinoceros, just plowing through there. So we are free from the power and the condemnation of sin, even though we're not free from the presence of sin. One day we will be free from that. But wicked and righteous are contrasted all throughout Scripture. So I think that's a um, book here. Um, that that's just a, something that that you see over and over and over again. Just wickedness and righteousness, they're contrast all throughout Scripture. Um, and so when, when it comes to to justification, then um, right. So th this is it, it's a legal. When, when we're talking about justification, we're talking about a legal context. Um, you are either righteous or you are wicked. Um, there's no in-between. Um, so Deuteronomy 25.1. Um, now, this is just, it, it's just an example of the legal context. You don't have to add this in. It's just helping us understand how, how scripture, all through, oh, well, actually all throughout scripture, their justification is there, right? So in Deuteronomy 25.1, if there's a dispute between men, then they go to court, and a judge condemns the wicked and declares the just righteous. So this concept of wickedness and righteous, um, right? And, and a, a good judge will judge between them. Proverbs 17, 5, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So God cares about justification. On this this legal context of, of what is right and, and or of, of who is wicked and who is righteous. Um, so when, when we're talking justification, it involves imputation of righteousness to the wicked. Now that just flipped what I read on its head. Right? Um, God cares about the righteous. And he's infuriated by the by, by the wicked, yet he himself was willing to, to flip that, give us his righteousness and take on our wickedness. So when it comes to justification, and the agent of justification is Jesus Christ. We want to make sure, not us, not our prayer, right? Um, it's Jesus Christ. The method of justification is free grace. God freely gives us that we don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to do any of those things. The basis of our justification is the satisfaction of God's divine wrath. Right? So the basis of that justification, why are we justified? Because God's divine wrath has been absolved. It's been taken care of. Justification is appropriated through faith. Now, I like this here because the very next question talks about faith. Um, so add, adding that in there, I think it's letting your reader know I'm thinking about the next question too. And then the result of justification is the imputation of Christ's righteousness, which is giving us fellowship with God both now and forevermore. Now, why does this matter for counseling? <laughs> And by the way, I have never sat down with a counselee and rattled all this off. <laughs> I have done that in a systematic theology class. I've done that in a new believers class, not at this depth. Um, right? I've talked about it in a whole lot of different contexts, but never in a counseling session. So why does this stuff matter? Why, why does all this matter? Sometimes when you come along uh, in... <laughs> I guess you have a relationship with your counselee, you can begin to maybe have a sense of a uh, full understanding of what the counselor wants to do. If you find that they really depend on the board for salvation, they might not. Like, it, it's almost like we sometimes need to go back to help them understand what it means that 
yeah. of salvation, not to try to get them to be saved, mm -hmm. but like, you know, especially if you're having you've seen proof in their life of the fact that the spirit is, mm -hmm. is, is living in them. You don't want to make them feel like they're not saved because they don't understand this all. But there's like growth in the understanding of their salvation. Yeah. Sometimes is needed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because maybe they're trying to do this number yeah. in their, uh, you know, like they're good out when they're bad rather than keep on. Mm -hmm. Because we have to walk by this. Thing. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe people who who um, trust in Jesus for their salvation at a younger age can struggle with this a little bit more as different kinds of sin have entered into their life. Did, did that sin entering in their life nullify their justification? Oh, yeah. Right? And I, I think the answer is no. But what we do want to make sure is that that, that justified state was there in the first place mm -hmm. um you know so there, there's often the conflict between calvinists and arminians and or, or, or arminians and, and i don't know if you're familiar with that whole that that whole thing but you know i i think oftentimes i should say often sometimes um as i've talked with my dad and my grandpa and my two uncles who they're on one side and i'm on the other we're really not that far apart um, when really what I'm talking about is, was that person ever saved in the first place? When they're they're saying somebody, um, they might use the term lost their salvation. When I unpack all of that, they're not really meaning exactly what their words are saying. Um, and so we're, we, we find ourselves getting clear. Now, there are still some, we're, we're not exactly playing on the same playground all the time, or at least we're in the same playground, but not the same swing set. I don't know, something like that. Uh, yeah. The next, the last time you spoke, uh, you talked about him. And who was it with, with the counselor? And when we just said, I don't Yeah. Now that is, I, when I showed Jim's thing up there, that's somebody who, uh, I mean, is there a chance in which later on down the road he could come back? Um, and man, um, I don't know what you would do with the guilt. I was going to talk about guilt. The guilt of for that time period leading people away from Christ mm -hmm. and not towards Christ. That is that is yeah. That's very yeah. Well, when you when you change your mind, is that's what that's called. You know, you make confession of faith. The Bible calls that the falling away. Yeah. You know, they really had no foundation. Struggle with her, they would have never. You know, they didn't know Christ. Yeah. They just knew of him, you know, and they tried to, I call it, make that. Have we preached, as you said in Matthew 7, have we done this, done that? Yeah. And, yeah. It's, uh, and and it was like, I think Hebrews 6 4 talks about it. Um, uh, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Um, I, I'll, I'll never forget when uh, I, I was taking my Sunday school class when I was in youth, uh, youth ministry through Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, if you've never read that book, I'd encourage you to read it. Excellent. But we get to the man who's stuck in the cage, and that's the verse that's referenced. He's, he, he can't get out. And it's not because he can't, um, but it's this mental thing going on in his head. He won't. Um, so anyway. Um, it's like the guys in the hut in Narnia. The very end of Narnia. They're in, the, they're in this hut. And oh. they, 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 can't see the, they can't see the beauty of it all. Yeah. Because they're just locked in the darkness. Yeah. 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 Question. Um, question, statement, sort of thing. Um, you asked, what is, why is this all important? Yeah. And one um, situation comes to my mind. I was talking to a guy, uh, grew up in a Christian home, went to a great church, with, you know, sound doctrine. And uh, so he, he was, you know, he said, yeah, you know, and I know the gospel, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here. I know the gospel, Christ is my only hope. And, um, but yet, <clears throat> How can I be saved if I keep going back to porn? Hmm. 
I think this says a lot to that question. Absolutely. Can you expound on that at all? I mean, what comes to your mind? When yeah, I so it, it, I, I, I'm going to say it in ways that we will never know for sure because we're not omniscient, right? right. In instances where you have a Christian enslaved to porn, he needs to be reminded of this. So he keeps fighting, right? Um, but a, a constant battle with porn without any victory can also call into question, did this ever happen, right? And so... In, in, in my mind, what I would want to do from a counseling agenda perspective is walk through this minutely um, and, and almost as painstakingly as we've done tonight, right, Where to, to see where are you with this? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? And if the answer is yes, we're going to roll forward with that because the implications of that then are you have the Holy Spirit in your life. You can understand the word of God and you can do what the word of God is asking you to do. Now, maybe you've never done that before. A, a typical somebody who's at the end of their rope, so to speak, in that particular arena, they'll, they'll say statements like, I have tried everything and nothing works. Okay, I can I tweak that statement just a little bit? You have tried everything you're aware of, and none of it has worked. Let's see if there's a little bit more, right? It's almost like using the Narnia example, right? Um, as then, or no, I'm sorry, not 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 Narnia. Um, the other one, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings thank you. Um, when uh, Gandalf, like the war is all, like everybody is almost dead, and Gandalf comes over the hill and saves the day, like. Are you right there at that moment where you're thinking all is lost? And yet. I didn't get that. Could you <laughs> every? I don't think we've had somebody in Apple is getting a whole dose of systematic theology. This is great. Um, they don't get it. Uh, yeah. yeah. She never gets it. I don't think she's ever gotten it once. Um, yeah. So, you know, the um, uh, that's. That's what I would do. What I never want to do, though, is try and convince somebody of their salvation when they are not convinced. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want this to do the convincing. And so we'll go scripture after scripture after scripture. Um, and, it, you know, what I want to balance that out with the person who, especially with addiction, who thinks, if I just pray the right prayer, if I just do the right thing, then this will all go away. And they don't understand the battle mindset in the, in the life of a Christian. Um, it, that's not going to most likely be the case. This is going to be in this life where sin is present. This is going to be a battle. And you need the Holy Spirit. You need the Word of God. And you need the body of Christ. Um, I oftentimes find it's the reluctance to reach out to the body of Christ. That's the big one. Um, I don't want people to know what I'm struggling with or, you know, what, whatever. So I don't know. Did that oh, yeah, I speak I just, to that a little bit? I, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. The, um, my, my normal illustration here with this, my, my mom grew up in the Pilgrim Holiness Movement. And, and when we were talking about these kinds of things, she was sitting, she, I don't know if forget when she said she had been every day growing up. Uh, at, at the end of the day, when I was in my bed, I would I, I would rattle through all the things I thought were sin in my head. And then I would end my prayer with, and God, if I have forgotten anything, please forgive me for that. Because I really believed if a tornado came through, if the house burned down and I died, I was going to hell if I did not believe, if, if I hadn't made that kind of a confession. And, and she said, and it was horrible. It was, I, I lived in fear the whole time of not, not recognizing a sin, not confessing it, and then going to hell when that's not what I want. And I'm thinking, and that's the opposite of this. That's enslavement. That's not freedom in Christ. And so I, I have found that illustration um, applied to lots of different circumstances has been very true. 
people coming in and and thinking if I I haven't done this or this or this, I'm going to hell. So really, I I, I can lose my salvation any moment, mm-hmm. and if Christ comes back or if I die, uh, there is no confidence in where I'm going. And and so I, I think this is huge because uh, when we're talking about guilt and when we're talking about you know all those kinds of things, this is this is massive, and we are battling with psychology in this area where psychology is trying to get rid of feelings we're trying to share real guilt can be removed and when real guilt is removed the feelings usually go with it so that's what i got for tonight uh so i think we we have emptied the dump truck and uh we'll close yeah i just um to add to that when i was reading um uh habits of the heart this afternoon, I was at the doctor's office, and he was talking about the Holy Spirit and the part that he plays. And if we listen to him, he's going to make it. He, he's going to, we're going to want to do this. Yeah. Um, we don't always do them right. Yeah. We, and, but if you listen to him, um, we focus on that. And that all part of it. Yeah. And, and I, I think there are even moments, if I'm honest, where I don't want to. Um, but that's where the bow, trust, and obey come in. Even when I don't want to, I can still bow and yield and, and confess, right? God, I don't want to do this right now. <laughs> I don't want to get out of bed. I, I, I don't want to fill in the blank. And sometimes it can be, I don't want to do the things you want me to do. And sometimes it's, uh, I want to do the things you don't want me to do. Um, now that shouldn't be 24 <laughs> seven, that would be indicative of something else, but I think there are moments, um, but where, where all of this for me brings a ton of hope. I can confess that I, I was at, at dinner with, um, we, there were four families that moved from Washington about the same time. Uh, we, we were one of them. So we get together, uh, just every, every now and then. And I, I don't always think they know, like, what do you do, Ben? <laughs> I don't know what you do. Um, and so they, we, we got in this, like they asked me some, some questions. And one of the questions was, uh, it, it, it dealt with homosexuality and same-sex attraction. And is it sin? And what do you do with, with those kinds of things as a, as a biblical counselor? Like uh, the, the question that came up was, is same-sex attraction, the temptation there, is that sinful? It's a really good question. Um, And I said, I think it is. And so they looked at me like, okay, so. And I said, treating it as a sin highlights and uh, highlights the cross of Christ and, and gives an answer for that sin. To say it's not sin leaves somebody without something to do other than, I can't think about this. Like, if I say pink elephant, what just came into your mind? Mm-hmm. Say what? In the room. Yeah. Like uh, there's a like hopefully visions of a pink elephant, <laughs> something I don't know about Dumbo or you know some, so, something like that. It, it it can be the same thing with sin when when we when we try and mess with what's sin, what's not sin, then we, we don't have an answer when it is sin. What do I do? So if if I'm attracted, you know to I'm not attracted to the same sex, you know, in, in, in that manner. But if I was, I can go to God. I can ask for forgiveness and I can know I've been forgiven. It hasn't changed my justification at all, but there is an answer there to that. I, I don't know. I, I might've convoluted some things, but yeah. But really that's not maybe the only reason why if we choose to call it sin. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh yeah. We, uh, you know, because the way that um, I, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to say my thought. Yeah, yeah. That if we make them think that the reason we're calling it sin is so that we can have a solution. For Correct, it, yeah. Um, they might get confused and not convinced that it's sin. Yeah. But like when we show them that out of the, out of the heart. Yeah. The evil. Correct. You know, that helps them to see yes it yeah. is yeah. and therefore you have a solution. Correct. 
Yeah, no, no, no. That, that, that's an excellent point. We we don't want to call something sin so that we have a solution. We right. want to call it sin because the Bible calls it sin. Right. Um, I, there's a, there's an argument out there that goes something along the lines of it just because you're tempted by something doesn't mean that that's sin. Um, right. And like uh, I remember early on when I was kind of learning all about biblical counseling and things like trying to dissect at what point if a guy's on a beach, does him looking at a woman become sin? Like I, I, I clearly re remember that uh, one answer was it's the second look that's sin. Uh, but I know guys because I am a guy. I don't need a second look for that to become sin. It it happens just like that. So what do I do with my guilt if I don't have a second look? What do I do with that, right? So to to your point, we we don't want to just make something, you know, call something sin because then we have a solution for it. But we we do want to make sure we're calling sin what Scripture calls it. And I think the benefit is we have an answer to that versus something you know, in, in the secular world, what's your answer if you're, or even in, in an integrated world, what's your answer for somebody who has same-sex attraction but doesn't act on it? You're going to try and get rid of their guilt by messing with things, mm -hmm. or you're, you're going to try and pat them on the back by saying, this is the best you got, or like you you just kind of make these things up. I, I don't know if that's helping. Yeah, I, I do want to ask, um, just recently someone said to me, is the thought as bad as the action? And biblically, I think yeah. so. I mean, if, uh, you know, if you, if you have thoughts of hatred towards your brother, you've murdered him, yeah. the Lord Jesus said. Mm -hmm. So the thought is the action. Yeah. So the person who has, the person who asked me this, um, <clears throat> well, I won't say anything, but um, I think this individual was trying to make themselves feel better that they had actually been acting, thinking that, well, everybody thinks like that. Yeah, yeah. My having done it can't possibly be so bad. Yeah. Did you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think people play those games all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I I would come back and say, I would much rather have somebody have a murderous thought about me than actually murder me. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a difference there. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. So um, and, and sometimes it is helpful to bring in some kind of an example like that, you know, like with with this, these these group people I was talking with, uh, when, when I said, so if somebody said to you, well, I'm tempted to murder all the time, I just don't act on it. Would you be okay with that? Eh, I'd be a little scared to hang out with you. <laughs> if, you know, ah, ah. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing it with certain things. And, and I think we, we can ask from a social construct perspective, why do we feel the need to do that over here with this, but we don't do that over here with this? Um, so it, there's there's some of those kinds of things, but um yeah, I, all, all that to say, I, I do think people can say, um, people think it and doing it are the same thing. So it doesn't matter if I do it, if I just think it, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. And and there there is a sense in which thoughts and actions break God's law. Jesus made that very clear. Um, but I do think there's a difference consequentially. That's a good um, way of putting it. And I, I'm right now trying to do the body and the soul. Part. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, so the thought is one thing, but when you do the action, you're actually sinning against that God honored physical mm -hmm. temple, you're saying. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to say at least if you only have the thought of it, at least you haven't done it against your body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Yeah, I. I'm yeah. not minimizing it. I I hear what you're saying. Yeah, 
Yeah. In, in, in a real counseling scenario, if somebody said, well, this week I thought about X, Y, and Z. Okay, it's sin. Let's take that to the cross. Let's let's ask for forgiveness, um, provided they're justified. And da, 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 da. Now, if they came in and they said, I thought about this and I did this, depending on whatever this is, now I have... I have more responsibility. They have more responsibility because there's there's a difference once it moves from inner to outer. So, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, it's eight thirty. I want to close this in prayer. But if we want to continue discussion, we can do that. Um, all right, Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight, and thank you for giving us the brain capacity to think through all of these deep but rich and good ideas from your word. And God, I pray that we would leave here tonight hopeful, knowing that your son lived the perfect life, died on the cross and rose from the dead. And all of that has been given to us. And all of our wickedness was given to him. And there is immense hope found in that. We can confidently come to you when we are struggling, when we're suffering, when we've sinned, um, and God, th that also has implications for how we interact with each other. And so I just pray that we would leave here tonight with hope, hope uh, in, in who we are, hope in what you've done, and may we be able to bring you honor and glory as we live our lives and interact with other people as a result of the truth of justification, the truth of substitutionary atonement. And um, so thank you again for tonight. Pray that you would be with us this week. Use us in whatever way you see fit. And I pray you bring us back next week ready to learn a little bit more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I have said, this is fun for me. Uh, yeah. It's fun for us, too. <laughs>